Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. I am on a roll now with chatting with cabinet secretaries in the Moore Miller administration. And this week's guest and our kibitzing with Kagan is the planning secretary, Rebecca Flora. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Thank you, thank you, Senator. This is, this is gonna be fun. It will. I have so many questions for you because uh, I think most people really have never thought about the Department of Planning. So I'm hoping that we will educate them. But I want to start with your background. Uh, mm -hmm. I am fascinated by the fact that as, at a pretty young age, you already seem to be on a trajectory that led you to this job. Um, so talk about um, how you started your interest, your uh your master's when was in urban and regional planning at Virginia Tech and undergrad at SUNY Plattsburgh environmental studies. Tell me what what led you in that in that path. Yeah, well, um, thank you. It's it's uh, thank you for using the word young also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's it's interesting. I, I grew up in the country in the mountains, in the Adirondack Mountains. Yeah, generation college actually fifth generation. French voyage were, you know, at a Rondacker. And so everything for me was about the woods and the environment. So environmental science seemed like a natural fit. And towards the later in my uh, undergrad, I realized, well, well, wait a minute, I can't like make all these places that I love protect them. Um, maybe I should go into the other side of the coin, which is how do we do better development? Mm -hmm. And started learning about urban planning, which growing up in the small town I did, never even had heard about it, but did a planning internship in a county planning office. And next thing I knew I was in grad school in Virginia, but, um, but loved it, but stuck with a focus on in energy and environmental planning actually. And, you know, it just, it really just came out of my roots of wanting to, I think, find a better way to conserve our environment. And I think I'm confident we can do that through better planning and development practices in all the years I've been at this. Well, the timing of your education and your career has been so perfect because it's the time where people have been talking about smart growth and lead certified in making sure that our buildings are green buildings mm -hmm. and certified as such. And, you know, that has to be really exciting to be there yeah. kind of on the cutting edge. It, it is. I've always felt like I was at the, at the front end, always yeah. trying to be the one convinced people before it was actually popular, whether it was green building when it was actually first getting started. Um, or whatever trend, it seems like I was always the one in the trenches trying to convince people ahead of my time. Uh, but it's, but it's funny. I, I as I say, I came out of undergrad when when Carter administration ended and went into grad school. Kind of dove back in during the Reagan administration and came out at a better time in the world to get some things done. But I've had a lot of great opportunities. Did a lot of my early professional years in in Pittsburgh. Which well, we're going to talk about fabulous. this. Yeah. Let's let's talk about the Green Building Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, you were the founding executive director and you were there from 1997 to 2008, a good long time. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about why you started, how you started and what you felt you accomplished. Yeah, I, the, the story on that is is actually just such a massive opportunity. The Heinz Endowment is actually Teresa Heinz. Mm -hmm. was really looking to invest in um, green building, having just finished her, her own family foundation offices. And I had gone in and said, you know, I'm ready for something new. And the next thing I knew I was being offered, started up and here's a grant. And so really took a lot of what had been my development experience at the Urban Redevelopment Authority and, and brought what I call the tree huggers together with the development professionals. Yes. And started building, you know, building that in that manner because we needed to move beyond talking to the choir, so to speak, and really bring other professionals into the fold. My dad was a contractor. I grew up on construction sites. And so yeah. I kind of also knew how to talk that language. I had been doing economic development. And so it was really trying to learn how to talk the perspective and language of all these other professions to bring them together around the Green Building Alliance. And we really grew it to the point of becoming the first in the country and, you know, really a lot of firsts in, right. in through that work. 
That's fantastic. The connection to your dad's career. That's, yeah, that's perfect. Um, then you had your own business, the Remake Group, mm -hmm. and you ran that until uh, until we snagged you to come to Maryland. <laughs> um, talk about being uh, a woman business owner and doing some of the work that you were doing. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this. It's 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 amazing being the woman in the room, you know. And uh, I think I think we're still struggling with that. I I remember, you know, years back, just you'd say something and nobody would recognize it, and the guy next to you would say it. It was like, oh, that's such a great idea. I'm like, I just said that, right? You right. Know? So yep. so this whole you know the whole idea of sort of being at a level where you could finally have a voice, mm -hmm. I think and um, take all of that experience and begin to use it in a very specialized way. So I did start the company back in 2010, mm -hmm. but often I found myself doing special projects. So I came in and out of different organizations, ended up landing a lot of grants in New York State and went on the inside of a large global corporation for a few years. My, my agreement with them is I'd go to work for them, but I'd keep my business alive, but I just started. Um, so it kind of been in and out while under that umbrella of remake group and then most recently was called back to Pittsburgh to act as an owner's rep on a very very large development site for three foundations so you know it's sort of it's a woman-owned business but I think it was more a matter of women's leadership which is different sometimes because we yeah. I think I'm going to say this and no offense to my male friends but Oftentimes, <laughs> better at facilitating project management, organizing, all of those things, which I've often had to use a lot of those skills. We're going to get to some of that in a little bit. Um, but we are so lucky to have you in Maryland and Thank you. on the Moore Miller administration. So talk about getting the call. How did people identify you? How were you? Um, how was the interview? How was getting the call? Just give us the the very beginning. Give us the insight. Uh, it, it's a great story, and Secretary Edwards just loves it. Yeah. Um, um, the appointment I, secretary, the appointment Edwards, secretary, who has done um, an extraordinary job. She's really amazing person. Yes. Uh, I I literally became so excited about um, Governor Moore, obviously before he was governor. Yes, that. Um, you know, I started following the campaign, but I'm I'm newer to Maryland, so I don't have the deep roots in Maryland. Right. But when he won, I was like, I really want to do something. So I put my name in the portal. Amazing. And um, without any connections or contacts in Maryland, and, and literally, as Secretary Edwards says, I you know my resume made its way through out of three thousand. Um, that were in the portal at the time, not all for secretary. Sure. I actually submitted for three or four different possible senior level positions. And that was back in November. Right. And then I had a call, I still remember it on December 28th, that just kind of came out of the blue um, and said, you're a finalist. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> 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 but can you be in Baltimore tomorrow? And I Tomorrow? Said, oh, my God. I, <laughs> this was the time between Christmas and New Year's, and I yes. was um, the holiday time. And I, I said, "Yeah, I can do that." And you were in Pittsburgh. All right, we had a momentary glitch here with the internet. Secretary Flora, please continue. Yeah, so I, so I received that first call on December twenty eighth. I remember it well. Ended up in Baltimore the next day. Um, got another call. I think that was like a Thursday. I got another call that that. Um, Monday, right after New Year's, and said, well, you know, governor would like, no, it wasn't the governor. It was like, can you give us your references? Okay. Did you know that the office is in Baltimore? Is that a problem? I said, nope, not a problem. I've done that before. I worked, you know, in different locations. So went through that step and then received a call later that week of, can you meet in Baltimore with the governor? And that was the next interview with the governor. And you know, reference checks and basically had a job offer. The governor himself called me, um, you know, right after that. And, yeah. and this is all happening during that holiday time. Sure. And so I, you know, I pick up the phone and it's the governor. Yeah. And he was just so gracious and so humble. And he's just, this is why I'm here. You know, his whole demeanor is just, would you come work with us? It wasn't, 
you know, it was all about him asking me, would yeah. you be part? And his, his whole demeanor was just so kind and gracious. So, so of course I said, yes. Of course. Know, and, well, thank know. goodness for that. So, yeah. uh, so briefly talk about your colleagues on the cabinet. I think uh -huh. each of you are, is such just a remarkable leader with a great background and a wonderful passion for service. Um, say what it's like to to be in that room in a cabinet meeting. It, it It's fun. I mean, just an amazing group of people. The way I like to put it, there's no egos, which is great because you know, everybody's just collaborative, fun, smart, incredibly smart. Everyone came from just amazing backgrounds and Wow, we all want to spend more time together. We don't we don't get enough time together actually, but but we do just enjoy each other so much that awesome. I, and most of us, I mean, we know a few people. Um, some knew more than others coming in. I I didn't know anyone sure. except one, which is Secretary Day. Have you heard the nice. Secretary Day story? Well, I'm I'm gonna be kibitzing with him soon, the Department okay. of uh, Housing and Community Development, the former mayor of Salisbury, and just the best. He's awesome. Right. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Let's go into the department here because we want to cover a lot. So, what did you inherit from the Hogan administration? What was your vacancy rate? And what are some? Of, what were some of your earliest priorities? Right. The vacancy rate is about twelve percent, which isn't too bad. Um, I think the biggest issue is not it, it, that's it's um, it's misleading. Because the vacancy rate at 12% is probably at least double that with the number of positions that have been essentially given away over the years or not or not filled. Mm. And so planning was much larger at one point in time. And so we keep doing the same amount of work, but keep losing what we call pins, which are employees. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I've been learning as I pull back everything is that... Um, that vacancy rate is is man will 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 fill that. Yeah. Uh, what I'm more concerned with is the lack of staff we have to do what keeps becoming added to planning over the years and the lack of um, you know, kind of I think understanding of planning. So I think that's a bigger challenge really for so, us right now. And so your priorities other than staffing up would be what? What are some top top of the I, I I think I, I I often just, but it's it's the whole notion of making planning relevant again. I think planning has lost so much footing in terms of just people's understanding, use, authority. Uh, just I think it's just backslid a lot mm -hmm. in the last eight to twelve, eight to ten years. Partly because I think planning is often seen as a barrier rather than a help. Um, and so it's really totally redefining how we think of planning and the way of urban and regional planning um, and how we can really be a asset in the state and to all the agencies. So everybody uses us, but there's not a lot of understanding of, of the whole breadth of what happens within planning. So I have a lot of questions for you. And part of this, I want people watching who aren't planners and don't understand mm -hmm. what this is to have a sense as to the importance of your work. So I was interested in the tentacles, uh, the boards that you've been appointed to as mm -hmm. the secretary of planning. So I'm just gonna read a very small portion of the list. And I just want you to paint the picture if you would, mm -hmm. for the interconnections. So the Smart Growth Council, like that makes sense, obviously. Right. But the um, the disabilities board, the Maryland, the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board, the Military Installation, Rural Legacy Board, there are a million of them. Why don't you talk about the interdepartmental work that you do and why that's so critical to your to your um, effectiveness? It, it it is. Thank you for that question because I think the total is around forty some. It was. Uh, <laughs> I had to have a spreadsheet put together so I could really just navigate it. I all. don't know how you're going to have time to do go to all these I, meetings. It, yeah, I I will. I'm working on that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that the thing about planning and planning in the terms of I like to think of it's urban and regional planning. You know, okay. there's lots of different kinds of planners, but you know, in terms of how we make better better, better communities, essentially. Um, it really is what I think of as the, the agency that's the most horizontal in that we basically have a thread through multiple agencies in the type of work we yeah. do. And that's, uh, 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 as opposed to a very 
topic specific area like housing for instance yes, yes. everything is interconnected in the planning world which is why i think we end up on so many commissions because it's like oh well, let's add planning yeah um because we also tend to be the facilitators the ones that can connect the dots between the various different topic areas to sort of say, well, these things holistically will create better, more livable communities, which yeah. is the end goal. Um, and so we do touch on, and I know my own career has touched across multiple spectrums of disciplines, yeah. which is the ideal, you know, in an ideal world. And I and I believe that's a lot why my resume popped out is the multidisciplinary yeah. um, experience that I have. So in addition to cross departments and stuff, you have a lot of different stakeholders you clearly must work with. I'm going to do a list and I'd like you to give a sentence or two on how the Department of Planning works with each of these. So let's start with counties. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the interesting thing is that through statute, we actually review all county conference plans. We have no authority to change them. We review them, we comment on them. And so we actually have a very direct relationship with every single county okay. planning office. Some we offer more expertise and help than others that are obviously have more capacity, but we have a relationship with everyone. Okay. Municipalities. Maryland has 157 cities and towns of quite varied sizes, shapes, and uh, and interests. How do you work with our municipalities? Well, similar similar way. I think planning is very, we're very tied into local government. And so while the county might be the most direct connection for us, obviously, depending on the municipality, whatever topic may be going on in that area, we may or may not get involved. Keeping in mind that under our agency is also the Maryland Historic Trust yep. and like the heritage areas. And then of course, we also have... Um, the Jefferson Patterson Park, but the Maryland Historic Trust, if we're not connecting through our planning and our local planning offices, we're also connecting through the various programs of the trust also. Okay, going to try to speed us up a little bit. Nonprofit organizations. Nonprofits. Um, you know, I think that's something I want to learn more about. I feel we can do more there. Most of the nonprofit connectivity that I've seen is through the Maryland Historic Trust. Okay. Um, like the Humanities Council, for instance, okay. Preservation Maryland. And so, but I think the Department of Maryland, uh, the, the actual planning services part of what we do, I think there's a lot more we could be doing in the nonprofit realm. Uh, businesses, small businesses, large businesses. Businesses, yes. Um, that's another one that I, I don't feel that there's a lot of activity necessarily with small business. But I think it's something that once again, either through you know, um, the municipal league or some of the other types of entities where we can help um, small businesses understand how zoning can work for them rather than against them. Good. Because I think zoning and planning is often seen as more of a barrier than out. Agreed. And speaking of barriers, the last one on my list in this category here is people with disabilities. How does the planning department work? With, for people with disabilities? Yeah, I think disabilities are all about how do we make communities livable for all? It goes back to that overall mantra. And oftentimes in terms of whether it's, you know, design of communities or how we approach the planning processes, how do we make, give everyone access? And that's a part of the population that I think is often is forgotten. Okay. Um, I still have a lot of questions for you. Um, the data center is under your uh, purview, and that also includes redistricting. Uh, we are that is in the rearview mirror for now, and it's only once every ten years. Why don't you just talk about the data? And you have data conferences annually, and and right. uh, where can where can data nerds? Uh, what would they find on your website that would be of interest? The state data center. Um, is basically we are the official and you know liaison between the census and the state, and right. all of that resides within the Department of Maryland, the Department of Planning. Planning. Yep, I think that is the biggest jewel, most underutilized aspect of our department. It is absolutely one of my top priorities. Mm -hmm. Is to grow it, you know, expand it, have it be utilized in an even bigger way through. Um, through a better use of, of basically this is a way in which I think we can work stronger with the other agencies is through sharing of data, you know, in a very obviously protected way, 
but to create better correlations and better decision making. So that that is going, it is one of my top priorities is to expand it. Let's be really specific. What kind of data would someone find on the planning department's website that would be of interest? Well, there's there is the typical census type data, but we also deal with all the property age, maps. Age, weight, uh, not weight, sorry. Uh, age, ethnicity, residence, income. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you for expanding on that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, but we also do a lot of the the GIS, which is the geospatial analysis. And so geographic can... information system, people who right. watch my things, uh, all of these podcasts know that that's very important for 911. It's actually on my list for us to talk about. So it is. And so if you take the technology we have today, we're not just a stagnant data set. Yeah. But if you actually use that in addition to all of these other tools around you know geography and then add analysis and projections in terms of future projections the power of that is just phenomenal Huge. in terms of scenarios of how our future growth patterns might look like particular um you know we're, we're for instance entering into an agreement with the department of aging because with the incredible pace and the amount of you know older Marylanders, we will have, we have to think about what's that going to look like in our community. So then you get back to things like accessibility and a variety of different types of disability. We can't make good decisions and we can't grow if we don't understand right. and use the data to help with that type of decision making. So when I, as the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville was expressing concerns about former Governor Hogan's proposal about I-270 and 495, one of my real arguments for wanting to slow it down, if not stop it, and thank goodness that has happened, uh, was because we don't know what commuting patterns are going to look like in a post-COVID economy. And uh, so is that something the Department of Planning can be at the table and help get that data and apply that? Absolutely. And, and to me, we have to be looking at scenarios. No one ever would have predicted um, the degree to which the dis market disruption that COVID created. And mm -hmm. we have to be able to actually put together scenarios that look at those types of market uh, disruptors that could happen in the future. And what does that do in the case of like COVID and how it has dramatically changed. Right. The workplace, commuting, a whole variety, retail, you name it, housing, mm -hmm. office space. Um, that's, that's the kind of area that I yeah. really am going to be very excited about, you know, if we can, I'm going to be going back for funding because we, yeah. we okay. really need to, we need to grow that area of the, of, of really the overall Maryland state in this agency and we're going to be able to do it effectively. So let's talk about smart growth. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the House of Delegates when Governor Glenn Denning oh. initiated smart growth and mm -hmm. Maryland is a national leader, or was the national leader. Was. What are we doing related to other states, and how are we doing making Maryland a smart growth state? Have we followed right. that commitment? I'm just, I'm just starting to dig into that, Senator, actually. Okay. I just sent out um, communication that we'll be starting to convene the sub-cabinet. We have two, two paths. One, to really do a strategic plan assessment of where we are. This is our 25th year. Um, and so <laughs> it's a good time to just take a moment and say, okay, well, what have we accomplished? Where yes. are we? What does smart growth mean now? Yes. And how do we really need to reframe? Um, what does that look like now in 2023? And so I really want to do a deep dive into thinking about what, what does that mean for the future as it was framed 25 years ago, you know, it led the country. <laughs> Uh, what do we need to be doing today to lead the country again? And I think it goes beyond the traditional thinking of smart growth. I think we have to think broader. Um, so we'll be pulling the sub-cabinet together. We're statutorily required to. And also the National Center for Smart Growth is doing a survey right now. I'll be anxious to see what comes out of that. We'll be doing some of our own outreach and assessment to really understand what does that look like come 2024. We will have a plan to go forward with it. I'm going to be so curious to see what the what the timeline has looked like about confrontation versus mm -hmm. collaboration and cooperation, uh, because I think people get it now in a way they didn't when we 
first enacted it in the 1990s. I, I agree. That's why I think we need to sort of celebrate that, but then also build on it and sort yes. of think about, well, what's what's next? Absolutely. And yeah, so concurrent with our new office opening next year, I'm hoping we can sort of look at back at, you know, all of those years of the planning. You know. Marvelous. Um, so what is one thing that people don't understand that you'd like to educate them on right now about planning or smart growth? I think the one thing they don't understand is that we're really all about communities. Um, this is a tool. It is, it's a planning is, is a tool. It's a method or a way of creating stronger, healthier, thriving communities. And I think it's connecting those dots that we help connect between all of the pieces that make a living, thriving community. And we happen to be the group that I think makes all those dots connect. Perfect. I bet you're going to work with uh, with the lieutenant governor more than most other departments because of her background as an engineer. We may. And I've worked with a lot of engineers in my past when I was doing a lot of construction and development work. And so right. I, I have a feeling with my passion for some of the metrics and the, the data, uh, once we have a chance to really sit down, I'm, I'm hoping we'll have a lot of good time together. Fantastic. Well, Secretary Rebecca Flora, the Department of Planning, um, it is time for your Fast Five. Five quick cool. questions to let people know a little bit more about you. Five quick answer, five quick questions, five quick answers. Ooh, okay, rapid fire. Here we go. Ooh Question number one. What is your new to Maryland, fairly new to Maryland? What is your favorite discovery in Maryland so far? Favorite discovery? Oh, just the um all of the great places to go kayaking. Um, I grew up in the Adirondacks, so this is a flat version of the Adirondacks in terms of nature, and so just all those really wonderful pockets of nature. So I was going to ask you about something, question two, but now I have to come up with a new question two. <laughs> all right, so hold on. Um, so question two then, uh, tell us about a cherished mentor of yours and what she or he helped uh, helped you to do. Wow, cherished mentor. You know, um, it, there's two parts to that, sorry. Um, one that I didn't work with personally, but who I have like so honored uh, in the work that was done was Rachel Carson. Um, and then following her, not necessarily a mentor, but someone who I just really respected was Teresa Hines um, right. in the work that we did in, in Pittsburgh and just what an incredibly strong woman leader she was in, in the situation she was in. So for folks who may not know the name, so she was married to then Senator John Hines of Pennsylvania, a U.S. Senator. And after he was killed in a plane crash, if I remember. Hel right. Helicopter accident. Helicopter. Very, yeah. Tragic. And mm -hmm. then he, she ultimately remarried uh, Senator John Kerry. She and did. They, were a, they were a strong power couple. Uh, right. Yeah. President yes, Trump. but she, you know, immediately had to step into running the foundation. Yes. And I, I was coming in right about that same time with the environmental program. You know. Yes, yes. Amazing. Um, okay, my substitute one. Uh, tell us about a movie that you have watched over and over. Oh, oh boy. That's a rough one. Um, oh, I can't. Nothing's coming to me. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, if you want to do movies. a... I don't watch movies over and over again. Is there, just, is there a TV show then that you like? Something you've been... Oh, I've been watching Ted Lasso lately. I okay. just kind of love Ted Lasso and the soccer. Everybody movie. loves Ted Lasso. Yeah, I, it's Lasso. just such I, a good story. You know? <laughs> I still haven't seen it. I feel like I'm going to be the last person in America who has not seen it. But I, well, I, I was slow to it, but I, I love it. So. Okay, marvelous. Um, question number four. Do you have an anthem, a song, something that inspires you and lifts you up when you're feeling frustrated or mm. down? Um, there's that happy song. I love to dance. And so any song that just has a really good rhythm to it, if I okay. just need to kind of go somewhere, but there's just some, you know, that it's like happy you know, you're talking about Pharrell Williams? I think so, yeah. Okay. It just kind of gives you that very positive feeling. Which nice. Great. That works. And the question number five, the question that I ask everyone, all of my guests, uh, Secretary Rebecca Flora, the Department of Planning, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is a skill or talent you have, something you're really good at, that most folks can't do? Well, I would say most folks can't do it, but I'm really good at reading the room. I do a lot of facilitating and um, I'm really good at observing the room and really getting a sense of 
who's participating, who's not, who's thinking, who's holding back. Nice. And I usually try to pull that out of people, pull, you know, pull them in. Love that. Love that. I always think that I'm always, I marvel at elected officials or political or any kind of leaders who can't tell when they've gone on too long and the room is bored and they need to just stop. <laughs> That's kind of the basic. <laughs> but. Yeah, yeah. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time to Kibitz today. And I look forward to continuing to work with you on important issues about Maryland's just continuing to be an amazing place to live, work, vacation, raise a family. I love it. Thank you so much, Senator. I really appreciate it. A lot of fun. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.